the, perhaps a bit confusingly, uh, the program said we're going to go from 1450 to 1630, but if we did that, we would be running into the next plenary panel. So we're going to run from, uh, from now uh, till about a, uh, uh, 1545, 1550, uh, to give everybody time uh, to get back to the plenary session if they want. Uh, we're talking about uh, financial stability and aspects of the INET uh, financial, do you want me to pick yes. this up? Awesome. Uh, aspects of the financial stability, the INET financial stability uh, research program, uh, which isn't one unified set of research, but a, a number of different uh, working groups looking at the causes and consequences of instability in the financial system. It encompasses uh, agent-based and network-based models on a window into uh, why these systems are so dynamically unstable, issues to do with legal and political economy approaches uh, which shed light on the institutional uh, character and architecture of the financial system. So we've got three presenters who are going to present uh, different elements uh, of the uh, set of issues that uh, we're involved in, and they are quite uh, disparate. Uh, but hopefully uh, some common themes might come out or, or we can address each of the issues uh, somewhat separately. But let me begin by just giving a perspective for somebody who has spent the last four and a half years uh, struggling with uh, financial instability. Uh, what are the issues uh, that uh, I've been struggling with, that the whole community of uh, policymakers have been struggling with, uh, and how do they relate to uh, some of the themes that we have before us uh, this evening? Um, I became chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority on the morning of Saturday, uh, September the 20th, uh, 2008. I am never going to forget this date. It was uh, one week after the what we knew as the Lehman's weekend, where Lehman's had collapsed. Uh, Lehman's had collapsed the previous weekend, then AIG collapsed, uh, and a by that Saturday, it was clear we were facing a significant crisis, though even then we didn't know quite how bad it was. But between then, that Saturday the 20th, uh, and Monday uh, the 5th of October, uh, was just 17 days. And by Monday the 5th of October, uh, I was sitting with the Governor of the Bank of England and the uh, UK Finance Minister, Char Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, in uh, 11 Downing Street, opposite uh, the heads of all of our major banks, uh, telling them that we will have to do a public uh, recapitalization of the banking system uh, that it would have to be announced in the next couple of days that the central bank was going to provide exceptional liquidity and over the course of the subsequent week we essentially headed to the part nationalization of two of our largest banks and in that two-week period what was extraordinary was to observe in real time the network interconnectivity of the banking system the, and the financial system. And the way in which when one thing begins to go wrong, you reach a tipping point of contagion and crisis, whereby it's like, it's like sitting in a, a darkened room with a complicated domino set where each domino is knocking over another. One of the most crucial elements of that was the interbank market. The interbank market was simply seizing up. And we could see that every day our major banks went into the day with a certain amount of money that they had to raise it with, from the interbank market that day. And because every day the maturities were shortening, people were only willing to lend them to it overnight rather than previously 30 days. By the next day, they had to be raised even more in the interbank markets. We were also aware that there were extraordinary developments going on in the repo market where a new form of bank run was occurring, which was not a classic bank run of people uh, a, a queuing up uh, outside uh, a bank and uh, asking for retail deposits out. It was a run on repo. It was a complicated process uh, in the repo markets and in the money markets uh, by which, uh, through a pro-cyclicality of the haircut process, uh, the, the system was losing liquidity. And again, you could see that day by day by day. So one of the first things that I learned was about uh, contagion effects, the way that the, a complicated, interconnected banking and financial system is uh, deeply susceptible to contagion effects. And that is one of the things that we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon when uh, Kopiak George, uh, 
uh, from Deutsche uh, uh, Bundesbank, uh, is going to talk about agents-based models for contagion in the endogenous financial networks. So theme one, how does contagion work in complex network systems? Once we were through the immediate part of the crisis, um, which was really September, the mid-September through to late October, where we had taken a set of stabilization measures where we thought we'd uh, at least have put a, a stop to the immediate danger of the financial system meltdown. It was obviously then time to think about what on earth had occurred and why it had occurred. At one level, it was clear that we had had a form of a classic banking crisis, that, that money market collapse, a dry up of liquidity, that was, we'd seen that before. And we knew some of the classic causes of it, banks too reliant on short-term money, banks which had lent money to commercial real estate companies, sudden lacks of confidence, etc. The world is full of history of banking crises. But it was also obvious, as we thought about it, that there was something different about this financial crisis, that it involved an additional thing, which really hadn't been there in the Swedish banking crisis in the early 1990s, or the Japanese uh, banking crisis in the early 1990s, or uh, what in the UK we call the secondary banking crisis uh, of the uh, early 19s, uh, of mid-1970s. And this extra thing was shadow banking. This complex set of relationships between newly emerged uh, uh, institutional structures, which by a complicated set of relationships between themselves, replicated the economic substance of a bank, which is maturity transformation with leverage, but did it by a multi-stage set of complex legal relationships and contractual relationships between money market funds, the repo markets, asset back, commercial paper, uh, issuers, SIDS, hedge funds, etc. And really getting to an understanding of how that worked, what were the contracts that, re that linked them uh, together, what were the incentive structures, and what were the risks created by shadow banking uh, was, again, a crucial thing uh, that we had uh, to understand. And another aspect that we'll talk about today in, in Dan Ory's work, uh, Dan Ory from o Oxford University, Issues emerging in the relationship between law and economics and about the way uh, that uh, uh, contractual relationships and legal structures uh, uh, create uh, particular uh, risks in the architecture, in particular of the shadow banking and structured finance uh, arena. Once we got beyond the analytical phase, um, we were involved in responding to uh, financial uh, in stability by a whole load of architectural policy innovations, but also innovations in the function, in particular, of uh, central banks. Um, as we in the UK looked back about what had been wrong with our institutional structure before the crisis, we became convinced that we had allowed too big a gap to exist between the micro-prudential regulator and the central bank. And that broadly speaking, we had had a central bank, the Bank of England, which had defined its task as being one thing, the hitting of the inflation target with one instrument, the manipulation of the interest policy rate. And we had a financial regulator, the FSA, which was attempting to ensure the stability of individual institutions, be they insurance companies or banks, through micro-level prudential regulation, looking at those institutions on an institution by institution basis. And we realized that what we had lacked in the UK, but this was also true across the world, was what we increasingly call a macro-prudential focus, a focus on the totality of the system and how the system in total creates risks which you cannot understand at the level of the individual institution. The, uh, risks that arise from pro-cyclicality, they arise uh, from uh, uh, interrelation of uh, uh, different elements of uh, the system. And we therefore decided that we should, in a new institutional architecture, put micro-prudential supervision 
back within the Bank of England, which is where it went on Monday, uh, which for me, after uh, three years' work on that <coughs> architecture, was Freedom Day, uh, where I uh, could uh, 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 move on from direct responsibility. But I spent my last uh, three years dividing the FSA into two groups, a, pr a conduct regulator and a prudential regulator, and the prudential regulator, now called the Prudential Regulatory Authority, becomes part of the Bank of England. But even more important, we created a body called the Financial Policy Committee within the Bank of England, focused on the big issues of financial policy, and with the power to move macroprudential levers, such as countercyclical capital or liquidity requirements. Now that is locating within a central bank uh, a new set of functions which relate to macroprudential levers. And within the European level, at the overall European Union level, we have created a new body called the European Systemic Risk Board, which again, with a very close relationship with the ECB, the ECB essentially providing the secretariat for it, but it's wider than the ECB because it's wider from the Eurozone, looking at those macroprudential issues from a, 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 at European uh, level. We've also seen major innovations, not just in the institutional structure, but in what central banks have been doing. Obviously, what central banks had to do in autumn 2008 was provide, or even earlier in 2007, uh, was provide emergency liquidity assistance. But what then became interesting is that what we asserted was emergency liquidity assistance provided on the classic uh, principles of central bank emergency liquidity assistance or special liquidity assistance uh, turned out not to be temporary at all. It turned out to be permanent. We had to turn it into permanent uh, liquidity support uh, to the banking system. And so we've had a huge extension of the liquidity provision and it's become permanent in the case of the uh, Eurozone, ECB, uh, the long-term repo operations, huge expansion of the central bank operations. And we tell ourselves when we first do that that we're simply doing liquidity provision and we're not doing anything to do with solvency support of banks. I have to tell you that the relationship between solvency and liquidity banks in banks it is very circular. If you don't provide liquidity, your solvent bank will become an insolvent bank. And anybody who believes that these nice easy divides between solvency and liquidity are, are absolute uh, hasn't sat in the middle of the crisis. And also central banks have been heavily involved in QE operations uh, in uh, European Eurozone, ECB environments. If they do get involved in anything remotely approaching QE operations, they are required by the Bundesbank's legal department to deny that they are involved in uh, QE operations. So they have to call them outright monetary transactions or uh, uh, LTROs, uh, which are temporary operations. Uh, but other central banks have involved in classic straightforward QE operations, uh, the Bank of England, uh, the, uh, the Fed, and a, the, uh, the, the, the Bank of Japan, uh, most notably this morning. So that raises the whole issue of if we've got new architectural arrangements, new responsibilities of central banks for prudential supervision, the single supervisory uh, unit, the banking unit of the Eurozone to be located in the ECB, this is taking central banks a long way away from the nice pre-crisis precision of you've got one objective, which is price stability, and you've got one instrument, which is moving the policy interest rate up or down. And so the issue that that raises is, has that changed the nature of central bank independence? Does it make central banks less independent? And that is the uh, work which uh, Ari Krampf has been doing at the Free University of Berlin is the basic concept of central bank independence uh, challenged by the evolution of what has happened to occur in this, uh, this uh, post-crisis period. So certainly in the experience that I've been through, each of the three issues that we're going to talk about today uh, have very much <coughs> been part of my real world experience over the last four and a half years. And we're going to take those in that order. So first of all, COPIA, agent-based models, contagion issues, Please give us some talks about that. And they're going to talk for 10 minutes. I'm allowing them 12 as an overrun, but at 12, they have to shut up because, so that we have time for questions. Go here. Okay, sit. Okay, thank you so much. Although, 
although tempted, I will not go into the discussion whether or not we should actually come out of the closet and admit that we are doing QE <laughs> and, and disguising as LTROs. But I want to go into a topic that is a bit uh, more related to the first part of the crisis, to, to the part where we actually got into this mess. And I will talk about contagious synchronization and endogenous financial networks. And the usual disclaimer applies to the views presented here, not necessarily those of Deutsche Bundesbank. So I want to start with four reasons why modeling systemic risk is a, is a challenge for economists uh, in general, but for central bankers in particular. So when you look at the development of the financial system in the run-up to the crisis, you saw four at least four things that I think changed the nature of the game. One thing is you see that, there, that the financial system itself has become very heterogeneous. We see a few very large, very interconnected, very big banks and a large number of very small banks. You can look at simple things like concentration in the UK was significantly increased in the US and certainly after the crisis this process has been continuing. So this challenges one of the very basic assumptions in many standard macro models, namely that of representative agents. When you have heterogeneity in the financial system, it might not be a good idea to just simplify everything to one representative agent, no matter how big the bank is, how interconnected. So that's number one. Number two, and probably in line with, uh, with the development that led to number one, is we, we see very complex interactions of these agents. So they are engaging not only in simple interbank transactions, not just in IOUs or in, in simple swaps, in a, but in a myriad of, of different, different types of interactions. And I'm part of the, of the INET working group on, on financial linkages, and if you want to read a bit more about uh, our thoughts on what to do with these different types of linkages and what to do with <coughs> complex derivatives, there has been a, a very interesting recent nature physics focus uh, where we put some of those thoughts together just as food for, for interdisciplinary research. So that's number two. Number three, we saw a dynamic structural change. We see processes happening on a day-to-day -day or even tick-by-tick -tick level. That is, interbank liquidity is provided intraday, intraday, uh, intraday overnight, tomorrow, next, on, on very different scales. But at the same time, you have a, a more long-term trend. You see a, a substantial increase in overall connectivity over the past decade. So you have two different time scales of processes, and you need to come up with models that either bridge the gap between the two or capture some aspects of, of both of them. And that is traditionally for economics models, this is challenging. We, we used to think, I, I do a bit of microeconomics, and we like three period models. Two time scales with three periods is a very difficult task. So finally, um, there are indications that under certain circumstances, you can have deviations from rationality. And I'm formulating this in the mildest possible way without completely making a fool of myself. Everybody knows markets in some situations just cannot be simply approximated by rational agents. So we have these deviations, and um, what, what we need to do is we need to come up with models that can capture this. So the two dimensions, this is a bit of a, a policy maker speak now, the two dimensions of, system, uh, the, of systemic risk that we like to think of is, first of all, is, is a time dimension. Systemic risk is a, is a mean animal. It builds up very slowly in tranquil times. You, you see it lurking under the carpet every here and there, but it's not really there. So it's for a long time, nothing really happens, and boom. From one moment to the next, when you are appointed, yeah. things are going very wrong. So <laughs> that is the situation that we are facing. Long time scale, nothing happens, and in a very short amount of time, a lot of action is going to take place. So our model needs to take this somewhere into account. And the other thing is that systemic risk can be transmitted through various different channels. It's not just interbank loans, it's derivatives, it's swaps, it's the interplay of all of those. So we have a time dimension and a cross-sectional dimension and we need to come up with models that take into account both of them. What I try to argue today is that multi-agent models can actually help you understand systemic risk. And the problem with those models and why economists are not overly fond of them in general is they do not feature a clear notion of equilibrium. And this is something very important from a, let's say, very human point. If I, as a central banker, need to inform our governor about, I don't know, whatever, I need to present him with arguments that I understand, but even more importantly, that he understands, because he needs to act on those arguments. And if I cannot provide an economic model that they have been trained to understand, that they, where they know the mindset, and where they can assess whether or not my, my assumptions are correct, whether or not they fit into the right framework, whether or not everything that follows from this model actually makes sense, they will not act on this, <coughs> because they have to believe and they have to rely on, on, the, on the assertions that they are making. So what we need to come up with is models 
that feature these different aspects um, um, of the new financial system, but at the same time build a bridge to what economists already know. And this is a bit of the agenda of today's talk. So what I'm going to do today, and uh, forgive me for having formulas, I tried to, to follow the spirit of, of coming up with a bit more substantial than just cheap talk, so um, there's going to be a bit of cheap talk at the end. But in the meantime, uh, I will try to tell you a little bit about how these models can look like. They have to be sufficiently simple to be understood and sufficiently sophisticated to actually make sense. So what I'm going to build is a very simple model that features two types of systemic risk that were particularly fierce in the crisis, and that is common shocks of fire sales leading to common shocks and interbank market freezes that potentially reinforce each other. So I built, I built an extremely, I think, I, I tried to think hard to come up with the simplest possible model uh, that captures at least, at least these two aspects fairly acceptable. So the world is very simple. We have N dates, not just two, but N, but we have N dates uh, and we have T dates and N agents and we have a state of the world that is either zero or one. So we are either in boom or in bust. Very simple. Um, the state of the world is revealed with a certain probability at each update step. Re remember, I tried to come up with something that I can put on a computer and run and simulate. So banks choose a strategy based on a private information, so they get a signal about the state of the world, and they also observe um, the actions taken by others. So they are, form they are connected through some network, and they observe the guys they're connected to. So if I lent Stefano 100 million, I will watch him very closely because he might run away with that money. So we form relationships, I monitor him. If he lends to me, he monitors me. So I, I will receive information about him, but not about all the system. It's related to, uh, to what Lord Turner said uh, about local thinking, maybe. You can, you can think of this as a very simple rationale for not, mo not monitoring everyone, but just a certain subset of that. So the bank's individual utility is just one if, if they get the state of the world right. So if I, have, if I choose a portfolio that matches the state of the world, so that provides me with return and boom, but uh, hedges me against the bust, then it's the state matching portfolio. But if I get the state of the world wrong and I choose the wrong portfolio, I get nothing. Again, very simple. So the thing that we add now is a bit of more endogeneity to get the notion of equilibrium right. So we will allow banks to endogenously form links among themselves in terms of, uh, in form of, of mutual lines of credit. It's basically saying you can draw on your credit line up to a limit X and I can draw on my credit line with you up to, a, up to another limit. And this is formed endogenously based on the notion of, of pairwise stability that Matt Jackson and others introduced. So for each bank, um, at time t, you receive a private signal that is generated according to some signal structure, and banks observe the actions of all the neighbors in the previous period. They have a strategy profile about the pure, st uh, and the pure strategy Bayesian equilibrium is given if the strategy profile maximizes the expected utility given the strategies of all others. This is where the notion of equilibrium comes into play. You need to take into account what the others are doing, do an optimal action, and all the economists will be happy. So now on top of that, banks endogenously form pairwise stable network given some utility function. We, again, we make the simplest, non-ridiculous possible assumptions. So you get some utility from a link that is based on learning. So because you observe more signals, you will have more information about the state of the world and you will have a higher probability of actually guessing right. So you get some utility from learning, some positive. There's also a term that is related to coinsurance or counterparty risk trade-off. If I get the state of the world wrong, but I'm co-insured, I can draw on a, on a line of credit to give, me, to, to give me some liquidity. I can avert um, a uh, costly fire sale. It's exactly uh, what was just mentioned about the reinforcement of liquidity and its illiquidity and insolvency. And I can avert part of that by drawing on the liquidity line, which gives me co-insurance. But if I get the state of the world right, and somebody else gets it wrong that is connected with me, he will draw on my credit line and squander some of my money. So I have this trade-off between co-insurance and counterparty risk. And finally, there's a lot of literature on how amplification takes place in these networks and in these systems. And we want to capture that by the simplest possible term, which is just proportional to the number of links. Uh, so G is the network, and the absolute of G is the number of links in the network, and some quality of my information. So when all this is taken into account, and then you can show um, the endogenous 
equilibrium network structures that emerge from, from this kind of model. And actually, when you do the exercise and you compare it with real-world interbank networks, which are typically money-centered or which are um, um, core periphery structure, you can come up with, uh, with endogenous networks that look very much like that. So at least this part we got, uh, we got partially right. So then we take the whole thing, you can solve it analytically, we put it on a computer, we solve it, and we check uh, what is the action that, that agents take. And what you can actually show, and this is what I, what I show you here, is uh, for different informativeness of the signal. So you have two signals, and each signal tells you something about the state of the world. You have two agents, and they, and they, they get different signals about the state of the world, and they form their belief. And if this signal is very informative, they will very well know how, how the state of the world is going to be. If it's not very informative, they have little information, and they do not precisely know. So, uh, what we have plotted here is for different uh, informativeness of, this, uh, of the signals, we have plotted the average action of agents in, in the simulation where the exogenously set state of the world is zero. So the right action is everybody chooses zero. And we plotted this for different network densities. So we fixed the network exogenously first and just simulated do, ag do agents actually choose the right, the right action. And as you can show, there's a regime we are just out of bad luck. I'm connected to a couple of guys who got bad signals, chose the wrong state in the first period. And because I have this private signal, but I also have this social signal from my neighbors, <coughs> I follow them in trend, and I also choose the wrong signal, and I also choose the wrong action. And then this process keeps going. So I choose the wrong action, and the next guy who's connected to me gets another signal from me about the wrong action and chooses and follows. So what you can show is that from this very simple behavior, you can show that agents, there's a regime for connectivity, low connectivity, and certain signal informativeness, where agents will coordinate on the wrong action, on the wrong state of the world. And this is actually explaining uh, why after the financial crisis, when you look at the correlation of assets, it increased substantially post-crisis to pre-crisis. And this is precisely because the world became much less informative after the crisis because you had all this noise in the markets, and then agents suddenly coordinate on one certain strategy. So this at least gives us some, some link points to reality. And you can show a couple of more results um, about the network structure, and you can introduce this endogenous network formation, and you can show that there's an effect that uh, where the network structure is reduced by having more precise signals, and the network structure um, plays into the, into the contagious regime formation. <coughs> and then you can play the two, and you can find conditions under which the contagious regime exists. So we can come up with a, with a very simple model that explains the synchronization of, of investment strategies, that explains some of the real world uh, interbank network structures, at least in, in, in a very stylized way, and that is sufficiently simple to be an understood analytically and computationally. And from that you can generalize now. So just to, to conclude to stay in time, um, what this model offers are two insights for low signal informativeness. There's a size of a contagious regime in which all agents synchronize and this size increases with uh, low signal informativeness. And the interbank network that you find is more highly interconnected when the signal informativeness is reduced, which is actually related to a very subtle point that, uh, that was made earlier, namely that when you look at interbank market freezes, pre-crisis and post-crisis, so with the Lehman event, there is in the US some evidence that there was no real market freeze, but there was stress in the markets. And actually, we were conducting a sa the same analysis for Europe and have the same finding. While there was stress in the market, it was not the traditional market freeze that you would expect. So it was not just that volumes have been dropping all over, but it was rather a much more subtle point, like who could get access to liquidity and who couldn't. And some guys couldn't, but others had still access. And this model also explains some of these stylized findings. So it's just to give you one brief view of models that central bankers can use and should use to understand a bit better uh, some of the effects that we've seen pre-crisis. Thank you so much. Okay. point in that which struck a very strong chord with me is this process where in these complicated systems they can build up risk in a way which is apparently calm right to the moment when the calm explodes. Uh, I think almost none of us uh, really understood in June 2007, which is before the crisis, what was about to occur. Indeed, if you look at the CDS spreads of major banks, or if you look at volatility as two different measures of what the market thought about risk, 
the market thought in about May or June 2007 that the financial system had never been more stable and had never had less risk. And you know, there is a real danger that we, we just don't get warning from market signals. These, these, these things build up stress and then for the sort of the reasons that these models illustrate, uh, suddenly become uh, highly, highly stressful and highly risky. Uh, let's uh, move on to Dan. Afternoon, everybody. I'm going to spend my time uh, today uh, discussing two things. Uh, the first, I'd like to talk a little bit about something called uh, the legal theory of finance, or LTF, uh, and its implications for financial stability. Uh, and second, I'd like to say something about the, the usefulness uh, and limits uh, of theory and models, uh, how we come up with uh, new theories, uh, and how we go about uh, getting access to the information necessary to uh, develop and test these theories. I was originally only going to talk about the first part, but there's a very provocative chart out in the lobby that all of you have passed by for the last couple of days, which I think is at uh, the core of the INET project uh, and something that uh, has been touched upon by various people uh, not entirely satisfactorily over the course of the last three days. So uh, I'm adding uh, to my original agenda in that regard. Uh, to begin, though, with the legal theory of finance, this is uh, the product, an evolving product uh, of a project that has been funded uh, by INET uh, and is led by Katarina Pister at Columbia University. Uh, this is one of INET's truly interdisciplinary projects. So we have economists, uh, we have lawyers such as myself, uh, sociologists, uh, and even an anthropologist. Uh, the project, uh, the goal of the project ultimately uh, was to examine existing conceptions of the relationship between law and finance, to deconstruct those conceptions, and then hopefully to rebuild some theory uh, on the basis of that exploration. Uh, the case studies that we chose uh, were uh, primarily revolving around credit markets, <laughs> uh, derivatives markets, and currency markets. Uh, note that we've specifically left uh, stock markets one of the areas that has really been the main focus of law and finance literature off of that list. Uh, and on the basis of those case studies and our preliminary work, uh, which is uh, now about to go to publication, uh, we have come up with uh, or articulated four main claims of what we think uh, the legal uh, theory of finance is about. Uh, the first is that markets are legally constructed. Contrary to the, the claim that uh, has prevailed in law and finance literature for some time, that law at best provides the foundations for finance in terms of private property rights uh, and efficient contract enforcement, uh, what we found is that the law is actually an integral part of the architecture of markets. Uh, law is not just the foundations, it's in the walls. Building in this idea in seconds, uh, markets are essentially hybrids in nature between public ordering uh, and private ordering. Uh, third, law and finance have an ambiguous relationship with one another. Uh, on the one hand, uh, law certainly supports uh, markets. On the other hand, however, the inflexibility of law at various points in the system can actually trigger uh, systemic stress. Uh, and then finally, uh, the law is more elastic uh, at the center of the system, that is to say more malleable, uh, than it is uh, at the periphery. So if we put banks, for example, at the center of the system and consumers uh, at the periphery, uh, we can see that the law bites uh, to a different extent and in different ways, uh, depending on who you are and where. So what is the significance of uh, LTF in terms of uh, financial instability? Well, I'd hope to illustrate this with two uh, case studies, uh, one uh, which you will all be intimately familiar with at this point, uh, another which some of you uh, may not. The first case study are uh, the pre-crisis uh, markets uh, for structured finance, so securitization, uh, predominantly in the United States, but also elsewhere. Uh, and the important thing to note here is that these markets evolve the way that they did in response to the law, and specifically in response to the requirements uh, under the Basel II Capital Accord. So if we look at things like structured investment vehicles and the asset and their resulting reliance on the asset-backed commercial paper market as a source 
of funding, uh, we realized as well that it was these features that created the interconnections which came to the fore in the crisis. Specifically, although there were other channels as well, we see the off-balance sheet risk coming back on balance sheet. We see a connection between the drying up of the asset-backed commercial paper market with uh, severe hits uh, to uh, the balance sheets of many banks. And sitting in the middle of that uh, were these legal structures that were designed to get around the Basel requirements. Now this is interesting from the perspective of LTF for two reasons, obviously. One, that these features of markets are not natural. Uh, whatever we take that to mean in the context of a social system. In the absence of law, these markets would have developed uh, quite differently. Uh, uh, and second, that uh, there is this relationship then between these legally constructed elements of these markets uh, and financial instability. And it's this connection between uh, legal construction and financial stability uh, that I think is the common theme of both this case study and the next. Uh, the next case study is something called wealth management products, uh, which are utilized here in China. Uh, in 2010, Chinese banking regulators, uh, in an attempt to uh, curb uh, what was starting to look like an overheated real estate market, uh, imposed lending requirements and uh, other requirements on Chinese banks. In response to this, uh, a number of banks uh, started utilizing trust structures, uh, rerouting the investments uh, in commercial property through trust structures. Uh, these structures were sold uh, to retail investors as effectively a substitute to uh, deposits uh, in a bank. Uh, the, uh, uh, the size of the market, uh, to give you a sense of that, uh, the, the CBRC has estimated that uh, as of the fall of 2012, that these wealth management products probably accounted for roughly 8 to 11 percent of the total retail deposits uh, in the Chinese banking system. So this is a pretty significant chunk, up from a very small, uh, infinitesimally small amount, uh, circa 2008-2009. Uh, again, this case study is important uh, from the perspective of the legal theory of finance for a number of reasons, but I want to focus on uh, the stability implications of this market response to law. Uh, here, obviously, uh, we've got uh, a retail product with a duration of somewhere between three months to a maximum of five years, using those proceeds then to fund longer term projects, including commercial real estate. So we've got a classic maturity mismatch uh, in this product structure. And intuitively, uh, we would expect these sort of structures then to have uh, the potential to generate financial instability, especially where uh, the short-term liabilities are being used to fund the longer-term uh, investments. And there are any number of reasons to suspect then that a uh, disruption to these uh, markets either in the form of uh, some sort of lack of demand on the part of investors because of competing products, uh, because of adverse selection issues regarding the opacity of these products, uh, which for those of you uh, that know this field has been an issue of late, uh, or importantly, uh, regulatory intervention, which is now taking place. So Chinese banking regulators are now currently in, in the, the difficult task of trying to figure out how to slow down this market as a way of slowing down uh, a continued uh, rise in commercial real estate prices without then creating the sort of financial instability that results when you've got this maturity mismatch and you take away the short-term end uh, of that play. Uh, the bottom line of both of these examples and probably uh, the most important question then from the perspective of uh, this particular panel uh, is ultimately whether we can extrapolate from these case studies uh, to say, well, when we start looking at the legal structure of markets, does this potentially provide us with a roadmap for identifying those places uh, in the system, in the structure, in the architecture, that are going to be most vulnerable to the type of stress that we saw in the financial crisis? Uh, and this is a question that's going to be ongoing uh, in my own work on this field and something that uh, hopefully at a future INET conference well, I can report back to you on. All right, the second part of the talk. We uh, only have two minutes. It's a, only a two-minute rant. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, the legal theory of finance is ultimately an inductive theory. Uh, that's to say we're taking individual case studies uh, and we're attempting on that basis to uh, build up a theory 
uh, on the basis of those case studies. The, in this respect, our reference points are uh, both real-world markets and uh, real-world institutions. Why do I bring this up? Well, there's the shiny flowchart in the lobby uh, that is entitled, How do we build an economics for the 21st century? Uh, it starts with uh, the first item on the list is a revolution of ideas, uh, followed by either application, framing, uh, dissemination, and implementation. Uh, with respect to the authors uh, of this chart, uh, I would submit we should reframe it either how to do bad social science or how to implement, design and implement dangerous public policy. Theory is necessarily an abstraction from the real, real world. There's no doubt about that. But the relationship between theory and reality is one uh, that the crisis has revealed as very, very important. Uh, and indeed, in many respects, the problem with theory before the crisis was not that it was well-articulated theory, but that theory became the way that we explained the way markets worked instead of empirical investigation. Uh, and for any of you who have read my work, uh, I spent a great deal of time documenting this, for example, in the disconnect between what uh, the Federal Reserve Board in the United States was saying about over-the-counter derivatives markets and what I, as a market participant in those markets circa 2007, did for a living. There was a huge disconnect here. Ultimately, uh, the notion that we need to get back to using reality uh, in all of its uh, complex, certain, and sometimes contradictory glory uh, is uh, at the heart, I think, ultimately, of the INET project. Uh, and I don't think anywhere is this more true uh, than when it comes to understanding the sources and potential channels of contagion when we're talking about financial instability. So thank you very much. Uh, Dan, thank you very much. Again, a thought that it triggered in my mind is, as we've been debating the causes of the shadow banking development, and in particular the extraordinary development of repo markets, it turns it out that they have their origin in minute changes in bankruptcy law and the creation of uh, bankruptcy remote vehicles and special preferences uh, within the bankruptcy regime. To the extent that there is one economist, Enrico Perotti, who, who has been arguing that the single most important thing we should do to remove the drivers which took a pre-crisis to problems in the repo market are subtle changes in the bankruptcy law as they relate to uh, uh, the, the repo market. And certainly the, the basic point that when we get down to the details of these financial markets, the, the precise uh, form in which law <laughs> takes, particularly in relation to these processes of default and bankruptcy, I think are absolutely important. Um, could we move on? Ari, finally, on the political economy of central bank independence. Yeah. Um, in, in the last uh, three to four years, uh, there is a growing number of economists that basically acknowledge that there is a need for a new type of thinking about what uh, central banking do. And in the introduction, uh, Lord Turner provided quite good uh, introduction to this um, process that uh, monetary policy making and financial regulation has to be more connected. In the next 10 minutes, I would like to discuss the implication of this new type of thinking about central banking for the political economy of central banking, for the concept of central bank independence, and for the legitimacy of uh, central bank independence. And I will uh, demonstrate uh, this discussion on the basis of the ECB policies during the crisis. So let us start with a very simple question. Has the ECB become less independent during the crisis? Now, in order to answer this question, we, first we have to define what kind of theoretical presupposition we assume uh, how we define central bank independence. So we start with the orthodox theory of central banking, the conventional way in which we thought about central bank independence so far. So allow me to reiterate a few principles that I'm sure most of you know quite well. 
the orthodox theory of central bank independence distinguish between the monetary authority and the fiscal authority. The fiscal authority is a political one. It draws its legitimacy from the political system, from the democratic procedure. Uh, the monetary authority is a professional one. It draws its legitimacy from the expertise of the central banker and from the trust of the public that the central banker is neutral, objective, and can be trusted. At the same time, the fiscal authority has the legitimacy to exercise discretionary policies, to implement policies with distributive outcome, because it is an elected body, and therefore it had the legitimacy to breach private property rights, taxes, etc. Uh, the monetary authority has to follow transparent rules, and its policies should not have significant distributive outcome. It, because it is professional and, and it is not elected, it does not have the legitimacy to breach private property rights. Rather, it has to protect them. Now, so far, so good. Now, what happened with this governance structure in the case of the Eurozone crisis? In the case of Europe, the, this governance structure could not respond to the crisis. Why? Because the monetary authority was restricted by its mandate, and it could not respond to the crisis. Uh, during Trichet term, the uh, Trichet pushed the responsibility for the solution of the crisis to the political election, to the G20, and urged them to reach a collective action uh, solution in order to address the crisis. But the government did not do that, and particularly Germany, due to domestic uh, consideration, they couldn't address uh, um, the crisis and reach and pushed for a collective action in the European level. Eventually, uh, the ECB stepped in and implemented policies uh, that included discretion and distributive intra-European distribution of risk and resources. Now here is the question. Does this fact implies that the ECB become less independent. Now, according to the orthodox theory of central banking, the answer is positive. The ECB became less independent. <laughs> However, when we look at the reality of the process, in fact, there is no evidence that uh, the ECB responded due to political pressure from European governments. Actually, there is evidence that it responded to pressure from the community of central bankers, that it acted according to the new paradigm that evolved within the community of central bankers, a paradigm that we can call the paradigm of macroprudential policies. Now, when we have this discrepancy between the uh, uh, the reality in which the ECB function and the theory of central banking, we have to acknowledge that there was a new type of agency which can be uh, called the prof a professional discretionary agency. And this is the main point that I would like to make, that uh, while according to the <coughs> According to the orthodox theory, an independent agency is non-discretionary. And what we see in the case of the ECB, that the ECB acted independently with uh, discretionary policies. Now, uh, the example of uh, this type of uh, agency is the European system of financial supervision that the ECB is put in the center of uh, 
of network of institution which is responsible for a large number of economic indicators. One of them is uh, price stability, but also for a large number of uh, <coughs> uh, a general, sorry, uh, it, it was put in a center of networks which is responsible for a general definition of uh, financial uh, stability. Now, what is the implication of this uh, analysis? So, first we saw that the, um, the orthodox political economic theory of central <coughs> banking cannot account for the necessity of professional discretion in the domestic and international uh, levels. And at the same time, the current governing structure is restricted because of the incapacity of government to respond to the, uh, <coughs> uh, to address the problems in the, inter the international uh, level due to domestic political factors. Now, why this analysis is important? Because um, what it shows that the question of financial stability is not only uh, a technical issue, but rather it requires liberal democracies to address fundamental uh, their preferences regarding growth, stability, and democracy. And the thing is that until the crisis, we believed that growth, stability, and democracy goes together and that they enhances themselves. That if you liberalize market, you get more democracy, more growth, and more stability. What we see now is that there is a trade-off between the different values in uh, liberal democracies, and that there might be the case that achieving price stabi uh, financial stability requires a greater, uh, a greater democratic deficit, maybe to give up uh, a level of freedom, and uh, this is not a technical issue, but rather it requires a reconsideration of the values of uh, liberal democracies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ari. Again, a very interesting contribution. I mean, it's a difficult conclusion because what you're essentially saying is, you know, before the crisis, we had handed over to central bankers a degree of discretion in operation to hit something which was pretty defined in target terms, i.e. price stability. But now they're doing a complicated set of functions where we have to trust them to be independent, and you're saying de facto they are, but with a high degree of discretion to make some significant trade-offs. This is placing a lot of reliance on a sort of international platonic golden class who are going to always make good decisions uh, on behalf of uh, society. But I think, you know, it is a major issue. I, I think it's... I think it's a particularly severe issue in the Eurozone because of the Eurozone structure uh, as an incomplete uh, monetary union uh, with a whole load of uh, fiscal debt at the level of what Charles Goodhart has called subsidiary sovereign rather than full sovereign level. So that when you start uh, debating what uh, you know, I just suggested are forms of quasi-QE, 
It, it's as if uh, Ben Bernanke and co. have to think about whether to buy state of California debt or state of Illinois debt. Now, because most government debt is in the US is at federal level, they don't have to make that choice. So they don't get into those distributional issues. Part of those distributional issues are created uh, by the particular structure of the Eurozone. That's the set of thoughts that I have. But in the interest of time, I'm going to go straight to the floor because there's a number of people who suggest it. Yeah, far away. Yeah. Uh, I'm shocked. Uh, Paul Davidson, Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. Yep. And particularly with a lawyer here, yep. I'm shocked that one word has not appeared, which is really the basis of this financial crisis, and that's a five-letter word, F-R-A-U-D. What you had is a whole bunch of uh, contracts put together that were fraudulent. In fact, the people who put them together knew they were fraudulent, called them liar loans, uh, et cetera. And this was then passed on to, uh, with uh, rating agencies, apparently not caring about what they were rating, approving, and then the banks, not only in the United States, but in Europe, buying these fraudulent loans. Some of these things were terribly fraudulent in the fact that even after they were sold, you, particularly the mortgage-backed loans, you could substitute a bad mortgage for a good <coughs> mortgage in a, in a derivative. Now, what do you, what, I'm okay. particularly interested in what the lawyer has to say about why the regulators, the central bankers, nobody worried about fraud, fraud which is what really is this, this financial crisis is all about. And, uh, Lord uh, uh, Turner, you may want to tell me about what your agency was thinking about as well. Okay, uh, let's take a couple of other questions and then we'll put them together. Uh, Katerina. Thank you. I have one question for um, Georg. Um, you are modeling in your, in, in your setup um, um, agents who make choices and have actually the freedom to make choices. And I think from our legal theory of finance, we would suggest that maybe the de degree of freedom is limited by pre sort of predetermined contracts that you've already in entered into a particular product that you have on your balance sheets. So I'm wondering whether you account for that or if so, um, how. I have a common slash question for Ariel. I think the, the, the key word here for me is not only independence but impartiality. Because once sort of the central banks exercise the kind of discretion which, by the way, is also hardwired in law, if you think about um, Section 13 of the Federal Reserve Act, which allowed the Fed to lend against adequate collateral, you will not find that in private contracting so much. That's the kind of powers we have given a long time ago to central banks. It's a little bit taken away now in the reforms later on, but there's always been discretion in the system for crisis, right? But I think once they exercise the discretion and have to put more play more of the role of a, of a market manager, then the question is, for whose benefits are they really, really doing that? And I think that the issue of impartiality is as important as independence. Okay, we'll take one more, and then I'm going to go at the front here. Yep. Uh, my question is that um, whether, um, you know, with some of the problems still remaining on the table, uh, whether we can really rule out another financial crisis uh, in the coming decade, um, particularly in the light of uh, 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 Professor Rockoff and Reinhardt's uh, uh, recent studies. Um, the, 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 the thing is that, for example, uh, during the financial crisis, there was a great concern about protecting the depositors' money and then the investment banking operations, the kind of um, um, uh, firewall created by the uh, Glass-Steagall Act. Now, uh, after all, all, all this um, uh, dust has settled and so on and so forth, it seems that this kind of um, separation uh, is not 100%. I mean, for example, um, Goldman Sachs has now become a holding bank. I mean, ba basically getting the best of both worlds. Um, the other thing, of course, is the, the question about shadow banking and all these derivative products. Um, they're, they're still um, you know, th uh, uh, running around. Um, and how sure are we that we are not subject to the same degree of contagion? Now, the, the whole problem is further complicated in the case of the Eurozone. I mean, um, the speakers mentioned about the, um, the need to give up sovereignty. Now, this is not always um, uh, tolerated uh, in some countries. So I then that, that complicates the whole situation about the stability of the global um, prudential architecture. So it comes back to my f very first question. How sure are we that we're not going to avoid another financial crisis 
Good. Okay. Well, let's let's take a quick comment from from you three, and then I'll I'll, I'll say something very quickly on how sure we are. Um, uh, Dan, can you start? Maybe on the fraud question, or on anything else you want to deal with? Uh, sure. So on the fraud question, and I, I, you know, it obviously is a huge part of the story. Uh, the short answer to your question, from my perspective, and I'll limit my sort of observations to the U.S. context. The short answer is I don't know. The slightly longer answer, I think, is uh, a complicated question around the trade-off between vigorous fraud prevention and other policy objectives, specifically ensuring home ownership amongst the largest percentage possible of the U.S. population. I think there's also a regulatory structure issue that we can bring into play that if you look at the mandates of U.S. regulators pre-crisis, uh, it was principally the Federal Reserve Board and uh, a number of its subsidiaries that had responsibility for the practices that went on in the mortgage market in particular. Uh, and I think there's a pretty strong case, and I think actually uh, the General Accountability Office in the U.S. has already put up its hand to this and said that the regulatory objective of fraud prevention simply was subordinated within that structure. So that would be my, uh, my intuition uh, on your particular question. Do you, if think I, it, do you think it's now for, in, the, in the view, or is it still subordinated? Well, I think this is, uh, this is an interesting question for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right? This is the raison d'etre for this institution's existence. Uh, my take on it is that uh, the reign that Congress has over this institution at the moment <laughs> And the way it's been structured within the hierarchy of the US regulatory system doesn't give me a great deal of optimism about how that's going to work out. Uh, and I think that they lost the battle when they lost the battle over Elizabeth Warren and over the governance structure vis-a-vis uh, -vis its relationship with the Federal Reserve. Uh, if I can answer the yeah, very briefly, the question, question about do we know? Uh, this is the question of my career. The answer is no, not yet. Uh, I spend a lot of my time attempting to find out granular level information about the exposures in derivatives markets. Uh, we were talking earlier about the extent of things like rehypothecation within the system and the ways in which collateral are being used in different derivatives and structured products. Uh, I have a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, and some optimism that once we uh, get trade repositories and SDRs in the U.S. context up and running, that'll give us greater visibility, and when I say us, I mean regulators, I wish it was me, visibility in that regard. That doesn't address, though, uh, that entire range of more uh, uh, tailored products where uh, you can do absolutely fantastic things with uh, collateral and the nature of the claims uh, in ways which make it very difficult to trace the end exposures. Harry? Um, I started with a question about sovereignty. I think what we learned from the European crisis and the response that while governments were not willing to give up sovereignty in order to establish a fiscal union, they did accept the idea that a professional body like the ECB took on himself the responsibility without being approved by any political decision, uh, breaching its mandate, and solving, you can say temporarily, but, but basically the ECB saved the Eurozone without, without getting any uh, authority <coughs> to do that but by the fact that it had the legitimacy, legitimacy that was not supported by the law, but supported by, by the trust of the public and the government, he basically turned the Eurozone to the de facto fiscal union. This may be an exaggerated claim, but there were intra-European transfer of yeah. capital and intra-European transfer of um, uh, of risk. Now, uh, regarding the question about impartiality, I'm not sure I understood the question, but I would like to say that in, if we are looking for uh, a solution that, that would be both uh, um, congruent with the law, with the idea of impartiality, you 
you wouldn't be able to find such a solution. The, the ECB was able to solve the crisis because it had the legitimacy to act by breaching the, its own law. So what I'm saying that liberal democracy can't have it all. They, can, they have to choose either they want financial stability or they want <coughs> to keep the high standard of democracy and freedom. And I think I refer by this saying to, I think, words of uh, Ronnie Chan yesterday about uh, this uh, exact point. Uh, thank you. Uh, go okay, first, uh, thank you for the question about the constraints on agent behavior. Um, this is a deliberately simple model, so no. Short answer, no, we have not taken this into account. Long answer, we know it, it should be done, and it's, it's more related to actually a deeper point that, that, that also Dan mentioned. Law actually does shape financial markets, we are aware of that, but it does more, it also shapes the behavior, uh, behavior of agents and, and how they interact with each other. And this is something that is missing in the models, but that is missing in, in all the models without trying to make any excuse. But I think it's, it's, it's extremely important to include this and to get some understanding like what, when you change law, how does this impact on the outcomes of this model? How sensitive are they? Very simple research question. And I think this is very important to, to get around to. Um, just to, to answer about one point about the, the fraud and then I, I, I wrap it up. So, I would be very happy if the financial crisis was made mainly driven just by fraud because this is something that we could prevent. My fear is that the system, that thing, things that, the, that were legal and are still are, took a large part of what drove the crisis and we still not put anything on that. So my major concern is with the things that are legal than the things that are illegal because with illegal things, at least in, in theory, we, we could deal, we could take an end to that. Whether it works in practice, it's a different story, but at least in theory, we would know what to do. Um, I think the other issue is, is for at least for the regulator, uh, for the regulator, and me, is, is, the, is the big issue that I'm that I'm concerned about. Uh, thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. Let me make one final comment, which is on the same point. You know, where did this financial crisis come from? Where did it come from? Fraud. Fraud plays a role. I think fraud plays a role at retail level, in particular, in the U.S. in the mortgage market. Frankly, not much in the UK or European markets. I mean, we had mis-selling of products in the insurance space, but they were largely irrelevant to the financial stability issues. They were just tangential in a, in a parallel space. Um, I think there was also significant fraud or effectively immoral activity in the wholesale space, a space where we have tended to have a caveat emptor approach to the idea that these are uh, grown-up investors. There are the famous uh, chats in New York trade rooms, uh, trading rooms about who is buying all this um, rubbish uh, mortgage securities and the statement used to be uh, the idiots in Dusseldorf. And then there's a famous point in a, a Michael Lewis's uh, The Big Short book where the guys at Deutsche Bank get really upset because they say if anybody's got a right to sell to the idiots in Dusseldorf, it's us. So why, 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 why are we leaving? Why are we, why are we leaving all the sales to these, um, you know, these, these American investment bankers? Why can't we get a share? So you know, there was stuff, and I'm afraid in the past we have tended to have a caveat emptor approach, and I, I think we need to shift that. But I agree completely with Copia. Even if we cleaned up all that up. I think we have to recognize that even if people have been not fraudulent, not criminal, there are systemic features of financial markets where people who think they are doing the right things are wrapped in networks and system relationships where they can produce disasters. And in a sense, dealing with that, dealing with fraud is difficult, but dealing with that may be even more difficult. And I'm afraid on that, I am told we are going to have to finish so that those who want to can go to the plenary session, which starts in seven minutes' time. But thank you very much for our panel.